So, hello everyone and welcome to our service. As you know, I'm Louise, I'm the chairperson at Newcastle on Tyne Unitarians. Welcome to the Flower Communion Service. We begin, as always, by saying aloud the values that unite our community here at Newcastle on Tyne. As free thinkers, we don't have a statement of what we all believe, because what we do have is a statement of the values we hold in common as we journey together. We welcome all who seek the meaning of life and who believe that human spirituality is wider than any one tradition and deeper than any one set of opinions. With the respect for our Christian origins, we seek to explore truths from all sources. Our fellowship gives us strength and encouragement in daily living. I'll now light our chalice. Then, within the heart of the flower. Within the heart of the flower, the fountain of beauty. Within the heart of the community, a fire that warms and dances. Within the heart of each of us, a spark of the spirit of life. Holy, holy, holy. And now our first hymn, this is number 13. Welcome to our flower communion. Soon we will talk about how this unique service was created by a man whose devotion to his congregation never failed, even in the face of the darkest hours of the Second World War. But before we do that, we have flowers on the table in front of us. And for those joining on Zoom, welcome. Uh, there, will be a, there will be a slide showing, showing the flower cards which are here on the table in front. Now I invite everyone to take a moment to contemplate the flowers or the flower cards and choose one. If you are on Zoom, please put the flower you want to choose in the chat. Whilst you are choosing, let me invite you to think about what flowers mean to you. Are there flowers that you have grown yourselves? Or ones that are particular favourites? Or perhaps flowers that have special associations, perhaps memories of loved ones? Is there a flower that in some way represents you? Is there a flower that in some way represents yourself. Let us take a few moments to consider the flowers. Now, for those of us here in the building, we will come forward and choose a flower. For those on Zoom, uh, when you have chosen your flower, please put it in the chat. Let us take a moment to look at the flower or the flower card for a moment. Consider the flower's form and beauty. Think for a moment of what it means to you or who or what it might remind you of. We will now have a call to worship. You will find the words on the back of the order of service. If you are joining us online, you should see a PDF uh, of the order of service in the chat so you can find the words there. Let us share our call to worship. In this, our worship, we celebrate the beauty of the earth, which is our home. Manifest to us, especially at this season, in the loveliness of flowers. We celebrate also our coming together to make a community of worshippers, each of us bringing ourselves, symbolised in the flowers that each of us has chosen in this, our chosen sanctuary. We come together also to remember and give thanks for human sacrifice, which has enriched our heritage and brought for us the freedoms we enjoy. Praise be to the God of our lives for all that is beautiful, all that is shared, all that is given and received in love. May it be so. So flower communion is sometimes called the most distinctively Unitarian service, but what is it? Well, some of us may know, it was created in the 1930s by the Reverend Dr. Norbert Czapek, founder of the modern Unitarian movement in Czechoslovakia. Here is the history of the flower communion. The story of Norbert Czapek by Reverend John Midgley. When in 1938, 
Hitler's armies invaded the country then known as Czechoslovakia. And throughout the years of the 1938 to 45 war, terrible suffering was inflicted upon the ministers and people of all the churches in that country. The Czech National Church had a liberal Hussite tradition and among the other denominations were the Unitarians, whose church in Prague and in other cities had been founded by Reverend Dr. Norbert Chapek. He originated from Rado Masul, a small village in the southern part of what was then known as Bohemia. He came from a poor family and after leaving school he trained as a tailor. But his great love was religion, religious ideas and church communities. He was converted to the Baptist Church and eventually trained as a Baptist minister. His ministerial work was successful, but under the influence of various teachers and writers, including lectures from the great preacher of the social gospel, Walter Rorschenbusch, he became more and more convinced that Christianity should have a distinctly social message, that God was to be regarded as the parent of the human family, that the human Jesus was our elder brother, and that our task was to create a new and better society for everyone. He also had a strong sense of the mystery of God. One of his hymns begins, Mother Spirit, Father Spirit, where are you? In the sky song, in the forest sounds your cry. What to give you, what to call you, what am I? And the last verse is Mother Spirit, Father Spirit, take our hearts. Take our breath and let our voices sing our hearts. Take our hands and let us work to shape our art. You may recognise those words because it, that is actually a hymn that is in our hymn books. As his religious ideas became increasingly liberal, he joined and became active in an international religious organisation now called the International Association for Religious Freedom, the IARF, founded in 1900 by Unitarians. At the 1910 Berlin IARF Congress, he met active Unitarians, including officers of the American Unitarian Association. Chapek also attended congresses in London, Copenhagen, Boston and Oxford. He left Czechoslovakia for a while, living and working in America as a journalist. There he again encountered Unitarian ideas and made contact with Unitarian headquarters there, but soon he returned to his homeland. With the support of the American Unitarian Association and later support from British Unitarians, he was able to establish a new religious movement. It flourished with large congregations and an active children's programme. Among the members of this congregation in Prague were many ex-Catholics who, reacting strongly against the Catholic faith as they had experienced it, had come to find the traditional communion service with bread and wine unacceptable to them. Feeling that they needed some sort of communion ceremony, Chapek turned to the native beauty of the countryside for elements of a communion service that could be meaningful to his congregation. The flower communion soon became one of the most significant services, and under his inspiring leadership, this new liberal religious movement flourished in Prague and elsewhere in the country. Small of stature, Chapek was nonetheless acclaimed as one of the nation's leading orators. He wrote more than 90 hymns, often composing the music as well as the words. When it became clear, however, that the Nazis would invade Czechoslovakia, Chapek's friends urged him to leave the country. His wide reputation as a religious liberal, his activities as a hymn writer, newspaper editor, preacher, teacher and lecturer put him in a dangerous position. He refused to go, but his wife Maya left at the last moment. Chapek continued his work, which became increasingly risky. Reverend Eric Price takes up the story here. He writes, because of the monotheistic uh, beliefs of Unitarians, he was able to accept into his congregation's membership a number of Jews who would otherwise have been rounded up by the Gestapo. This gave them precious time in which to plan their escape from the country. When, after two years, this merciful plan was discovered, Dr. Chapek, along with his daughter Zora, was arrested. She for the crime of listening to the BBC on the radio, and he for the same offence and for high treason. 
Several of his sermons were cited as evidence of the latter charge. Listening to foreign broadcasts was a capital offence under the Nazi protectorate. Eventually, he was sent to Dachau concentration camp and Zora was sent to a labour camp. Almost a year after his arrest, Chapek's name appears among prisoners sent on October the 12th, 1942 to Hartheim Castle near Linz in Austria, where he died of poison gas. Before his death, Dr. Chapek's courage in the face of torture and starvation was a source of inspiration to his fellow prisoners. Some of those who survived testified that the Unitarian leader could not have been sent to a place where he was more needed than Dasha. Fortified by his words and example, they held on, despite the grim agonies of the camp, which was to live in history as a horrible example of Nazi bestiality. When news of Dr. Chapek's death reached America in 1945, the then president of the American Unitarian Association, Dr. Frederick May Elliott wrote, Another name is added to the list of heroic Unitarian martyrs, by whose death our freedom has been bought. Since that time, many Unitarian churches in America have celebrated the Flower Communion. In 1965, the Reverend Eric Price brought a version of the service and the story of Norbert Chapek to Britain. Since then, an increasing number of British Unitarian congregations have held this service annually. They hold it partly for its own great beauty, partly as a symbolic expression of giving and receiving in our worship together as a congregation, and now also as a fitting memorial to Reverend Chapek, who created this service in happier days. So the day in which we celebrate the beauty of our world as we see it in flowers, we rejoice in all we give and receive from our freedom to worship together as our hearts and minds prompt us. And at a time when we could see greater freedoms have returned to what is now the Czech Republic and other parts of Europe, but some parts of Europe are now faced with great challenges and suffering and a threat to their freedom and existence. This occasion has become for us also a kind of Unitarian Saints Day. Dr. Chapek's life of service reached its climax in gravity. We shall remember him in our worship as we share the beauty of flowers. May it be so. And let us now have our second hymn, Triumph at Last. Even over the hand that gathers it, cuts it off from life, from roots, from the memory and taste of iron and tears in the soil. Blessed be the flower that triumphs at last over the closed rooms that are not its home over efforts to domesticate its wild truth, over the vain words of priests and poets. Blessed be the flower that triumphs at last over us, over pasts and futures, over words and silences, over deaths and lives, placing them all in their proper place, restoring to all things their joyful smallness. Blessed be the flower that triumphs at last. We've seen two notable anniversaries. The obvious one is the Jubilee, 70 years of the reign of Queen Elizabeth II. I imagine we've probably all heard our own national anthem once or twice recently, uh, so many various occasions, not least uh, yesterday's football match, about which, which the less said the better. Um, the other one, which I think many of us here will be aware of, is that as of June the 3rd, 2022, there have been 100 days of war in Europe following Russia's attack upon Ukraine. And I think many of you will have noticed I'm wearing the Ukrainian colours. Stability at home and chaos abroad, and yet not. I don't think it is wishing anyone ill to observe that sooner or later, Queen Elizabeth's reign will end. Everything mm. that is solid one day melts into air. The only real constant throughout her time on the throne has been changed. I was thinking of this whilst I walked around my home of Heaton in Newcastle, looking at the flowers that many people grow in their gardens, and came across a rather spectacular display of sunflowers. Alas, my phone battery has gone flat, so I'd have liked a picture of them. But, yeah, you just have to imagine. Everyone loves sunflowers. 
They remind us of the star that fuels all life on this earth. We grow them when we're kids and often when we're adults. They look cheerful, we eat their seeds in muesli. And those of us of a certain age, and I've just realised because I've actually written that and read it out loud, it's people I'm getting old, uh, can <laughs> still sing the Vital Life song. Later, of course, the sunflower has become the symbol of Ukraine. It is their national flower, as the red rose is the flower of England. It has become a symbol of hope and also of conflict. Who can forget the story of the Ukrainian older woman who confronted an armed Russian soldier and offered him sunflower seeds? saying, put sunflower seeds in your pocket, that way they will grow when you die and are buried here in our soil. That's not a nice story because war and conflict are not nice. I love the flower communion because it's a beautiful service happening at what is often the loveliest time of our year. We've had some wonderful weather recently. And yet at the same time, perhaps sometimes we forget, as we heard earlier, it has its roots in the worst conflict in human history. It was created by a brave man who suffered and was then horribly killed by tyrants. At this point, I really wish that here, standing in front of everybody, I had an answer for this. I think that everyone who stands here on a Sunday will at some point confront the fact that religion, spirituality, call it what you will, is perhaps sometimes best characterised as an attempt to explain the unexplainable. Alongside that, comes the terrifying feeling, if you belong to a questioning faith like ours, that does not have easy answers, that does not say, as some would say, it was God's will, or they must have displeased God, to answer all unhappy outcomes, that you were inadequate to the task at hand. Here's one Unitarian's view of this. How can I keep on singing when all around me tears my heart? The battle cry of strife has claimed more lives than ever known before. How can I go on loving when all around me lives are cut short? With homes destroyed and dreams are dead, how long, dear God, how long? How can I go on living when all around me is emptiness and void, when starving children plead with hungry eyes? How can I go on when all around millions weep and mourn for family, friends and kin, beloved cat, dog and horse? How can I keep on praying when all around me I numbly hear the anguished cries that pierce the air? How long, dear God, how long? From the abyss of doubt and fear, our struggling minds numbly repeat, Kyrie. Grant us mercy, strength and peace. Do not turn our hearts to cold, to seek, to hurt and act in revenge. Have mercy on us, divine unity, great creator. Spirit of all that is and truth within, make our courage great. Rekindle in our hearts hope and steadfast love to help those who cry into the empty void and show compassion. Turn our sighing into loving, turn our weeping to hope. Speak to us words of comfort and peace. Grant to us now your loving spirit to kindle in us one song of peace from every human heart. May it be so. Amen. Those are words by Paul Lindsay Dawson at Wakefield. At the same time this week, I also read this letter in the paper. The world is heading for climate burnout. Inflation spirals upwards and hundreds of thousands fall into poverty. The government is led by a law-breaking narcissist, ridiculed by many in his own party and most of the country. And in The Guardian, I opened the magazine to see a page and a half devoted to resolving the conundrum, should my husband stop dusting with a dry cloth? No room is dark enough to lie down. <laughs> <laughs> Ironically, I actually rather disagree with the letter writer. Not because I think he's wrong, it is a he, to point out the grimness of the situation we face. After all, after over 100 days of war, hate, conflict in Europe, I think many of us feel that creeping sensation we know that in fiction, the plucky defenders standing up for the brutal invader usually triumph. In real life, we don't always get happy endings. But at the same time, none of us can fix the war in Ukraine, climate change, the cost of living crisis, or any of the other evils of our age on our own or in their entirety. 
I'm reminded actually, thinking as I read this, of the foundation of this building. It was when its building was initiated, those who did so didn't know the Second World War was coming, although they probably had some intimation that things were not going well in Europe. But it was first come through, it was first had its first service held here and became a place of worship in 1939. We're hardly the first Unitarians to sit here and confront so many different and difficult problems and in a time of war. We can and should certainly do what we can to contribute towards solving problems. We can pray, we can send money to good causes, we can campaign, we can write to our representatives, and some of us have even opened our homes to refugees and driven trucks of supplies to people in desperate need. But at the same time, we can't fix everything entirely. And if we dwell too long on despair, we become paralyzed, unable to do what we can do for fear of what we can't. Life for most of us involves a continual holding in balance between the needs of the world, the needs of our community, the needs of our families and friends, whatever forms those take, and our own needs including arguments about who has to do the dusting and how it gets dusted. My favourite book of the Bible, you can tell I was a Sunday school child, is the book of Ecclesiastes, which ends with the marvellously paradoxical verses. Remember him before the silver cord is severed and the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the spring and the wheel broken at the well, and the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Meaningless, meaningless, said the teacher. Everything is meaningless. And then at the end, in the section entitled The Conclusion of the Matter, as if the editor of the book had decided to put in a footnote, another voice writes, not only was the teacher wise, but he also imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true, which is evidently not the action of someone in utter despair. Sometimes, even when all our wisdom says that all is meaningless, we go on, like the teacher, no matter what. Perhaps we might like to plant a few sunflowers. Last year, I said, so at this time, when to the flower communion, we celebrate our community, we do so with all that our hearts contain, our joys and our concerns. <clears throat> our whole selves are here. We do not pretend that our world contains only the light and only the joy. We know and acknowledge that light and darkness, joy and sorrow are all a part of our being. And when we take our flowers from the altar, as we will do soon, we do so knowing that this community is here with us and for us. Soon we will reach the longest day of the year and the wheel of the year will turn back towards darker nights, but we are not there yet. We are all travellers on this journey together. And now with that in mind, let us have the final part of our flower communion. Um, as that each of us in turn considers the flowers, if you are joining on Zoom, you may wish to contemplate the flower cards again and perhaps choose a different one to one you looked at earlier. Uh, if you choose to do that, please put that in the chat. I ask that as each of us in turn considers our flowers, we do so quietly, reverently, and with a sense of how important it is for each of us to address our world and one another with gentleness, justice, and love. When we take our flowers, excuse me, please note their shape and beauty and handle them with love. These are gifts that we have chosen this day and which are given to all of us. It was held earlier by a member of this congregation and therefore has a little of their unique humanity and deserves the kindest touch. And with regard to kindest touch, a small safety note, obviously there are lit candles on the table. So I advise that everyone picks up their flowers from the side of the table, please don't reach over the candles. So, I will post flower cards uh, for those attending on Zoom to their homes. Uh, and I now invite everybody to come. I have put out the physical flame of our chalice, but its light burns within us until we meet once more. And now a final prayer. This is by the Reverend Cliff Reed, 
for a flower communion. We ask a blessing as we part. May we go from here to kindle hope where sorrow's darkness reigns, telling of those who overcame it by the power of spirit. In smelling the sweet fragrance of faith's flowers, in breathing the air of compassion, and in opening our hearts to those who suffer, may our souls shine as radiant as the sun. May the warmth of divine love flow through us to all our neighbours upon this good earth. May it be so.